We're starting the recording. Can somebody look at my computer screen and see me moving? I can see you moving. Okay, cool. I can see you moving. That's awesome. You're awesome. The energy from over there is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're awesome. All right. Um, so we're finishing lecture 4.4 right now. Okay. And we're going into electrolysis, not electrochemical cells, electrolysis applications. Okay. This is part C, electrolysis applications. And, and thinking about you know the order that we did this chapter in, where we start with electrolysis, then move to electrochemical cells, and then come back to electrolysis, I actually kind of like that better than, okay, here's electrochemical cells, and then here's electrolytic cells. Um, because you guys are exposed to both things relatively early before you like start solidifying, okay, the positive thing is a cathode for electrochemical cells, and that sort of thing. And then electrolysis is like the curveball where everything's changed, and you're like, what? So I think, I think this is better than like coming back to electrolysis than just introducing it to you now. But I'm going to say anyways, star and circle, not electrochem cells. So D chem. Okay, so no longer is the positive electrode the cathode, no longer is the negative electrode the anode. It's the other way around. Okay? <clears throat> it's still reduction at the cathode though. So cathode. We're just going to write this here. The cathode is now the negative electrode because it's electrolysis, uh, but still reduction. Okay, and then the anode is positive, the positive electrode, but it's still oxidation. Okay, these are changed because we are no longer seeing how much voltage is, a, is produced from a reaction. Instead, we are doing a reaction by applying voltage. Okay? So in essence, we're making something happen that wouldn't normally happen. Okay? This is how, if you recall from lecture uh, 4.2, I think, this is how we make um, things that are commonly really easily reduced, like chlorine gas. Chlorine gas has a very high reduction potential, and so it exists mostly as chlorine ions. But if we want chlorine gas, we need to basically oxidize the chlorine by using something like voltage to make it happen, make the reverse happen, okay? And so here, uh, they liked, uh, at the very end of this really, this really long chapter, chapter 20, they uh, are telling us about electrolysis of different things, okay? The first one and the most simple one to understand, I think, is the electrolysis of a molten ionic solution. Okay, If you have a molten ionic solution, you only have two things present in your solution, right? If we, if we take solid sodium chloride, this does not conduct electricity, but if we add heat, we can actually make it sodium plus liquid and chlorine minus liquid, okay? That's just melting the ionic solid, okay? And so we have this, this is the only two ions that we have in our solution, and so when we electrolyze molten sodium chloride, we see that sodium hot plus is reduced at the cathode, okay, and then chlorine minus is oxidized at the anode, okay? And so at the cathode, we get sodium solid, and at the anode, we get chlorine gas, okay? And so we're essentially reversing something that 
that happens, uh, we're, we're, we're reversing the sodium ions becoming sodium ions because sodium solid prefers to be sodium ions, right? That's why it explodes in water. But if we want to get sodium solid, this is one pretty straightforward way of doing it where you just electrolyze something with sodium in it, okay? Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, ionic compounds, whatever is in the ionic compound, if that's it, then when you electrolyze it, then the, the products are going to be pretty easy to determine. Here, this is a positive ion, and so it's going to be reduced into whatever its elemental form is. And this is a negative ion, so it's going to be oxidized to its elemental form as well. So let's do a real quick example on molten ionic compound electrolysis. Um, what is formed when molten aluminum oxide Al2O3 is electrolyzed. Tell me what's formed and where it's formed, okay? Telling me where, like, cathode or anode um, is, is actually pretty important. Um, that's usually what they care about here, okay? Um, so what do you guys think? Alex? Good, so at the cathode, aluminum three plus is reduced to aluminum solid at the cathode. What happens at the anode? Colin? Yeah, so oxygen two minus is oxidized to oxygen gas at the anode. These obviously right here are not balanced, okay? And it's not even like the molar, the correct molar ratios for what we have here. But all we're doing is predicting what's gonna show up at the cathode and what's gonna show up at the anode, okay? What questions do you have about molten ionic electrolysis? Does this make sense? Okay, I think this is pretty straightforward. If you don't think it's straightforward, that's like when you would ask me that the question, like, oh, I don't understand that, that part, okay? But electrolysis of molten ionic solutions should be straightforward here because there's only two things. Um, now, moving forward, <laughs> aqueous solutions are a little bit more complex, but not that much, okay? Um, it, they're only more complex because it's not just sodium ions and chloride ions that are present. Water's present, too. And you can either reduce or oxidize water. And so depending on which one is easier to reduce or oxidize, you might not get sodium at the cathode. Okay? You might get something else, like hydrogen gas. So uh, here we go. Let's, let's do the second thing here. This will just be electrolysis of aqueous solutions. How do you guys suppose we determine what's going to be oxidized or reduced? How would you know? Any ideas? Harry? Is it like the anode is the anion and the cathode is the cathode? Sure, but if it's an aqueous solution, is it going to be the cation or is it going to be water that's reduced? Like how, like that's what I guess my question was. I didn't, I didn't phrase it very well. Vincent, do you have any ideas? The reactivity chart? Reactivity chart? Perfect. Um, so we'll just get started with that. Uh, yeah. Um, electrolysis of aqueous solutions. Okay. Um, so this is there's some more moving parts. It's not as straightforward as molten ionic, but here we go. Um, NaCl aqueous is not quite just NaCl, right? This actually has a lot of things going for it. This aqueous right here is the key, okay? How do we make sodium chloride aqueous? What do we do? Water, okay? And so in our sodium chloride aqueous solution, we have four ions, okay? We have 
I don't like this arrow. We have four ions. We have sodium plus aqueous, right? That's, of course, because it's an ionic compound. It dissociates completely, okay? So we have sodium plus, um, and of course, we also have chlorine minus aqueous, okay? That, those are kind of given because it's an ionic compound. But we also have hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Where do these come from? The auto ionization of water. Okay? So even though this is not really, like these ions aren't in high concentrations per se, in a normal, like, neutral water solution, they are there. Okay? And so if we are going to electrolyze aqueous sodium chloride, we have to t take into consideration the presence of these ions. Okay? And so if we um, electro or set up an electrolysis apparatus, we only have one cathode and one anode, okay? And so the, 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 the tricky part really comes up because only two things can be discharged only two things can be discharged during electrolysis, okay? Discharge just means, oh, like for our molten electro or our molten um, sodium chloride, sodium, we would say sodium solid is discharged at the cathode and chlorine gas is discharged at the anode. So when we're doing electrolysis, only two things can be discharged. Only two products are ever going to come out, even if we have more than one, uh, even if we have more than two ions, okay? And so we have to kind of set up, like we have to take inventory and then compare which ones are going to be um, showing up there, okay? And so the two things we need to keep in mind for this is the E standard, the, the standard reduction potential for each ion, okay? And the concentration of the ions, okay? Because if one normally wouldn't be discharged at the cathode, but then you increase the concentration like a lot, it might actually suddenly be discharged at the cathode. Okay, so we're going to look at both of these for this specific example. So um, part A. This is a subsection of two. Okay, as the reduction potential becomes more positive. As it becomes more positive, it is more likely there we are again with the not like it's not hard and fast, yes, that's going to happen. It's probably probability, right? It is more likely for where am I? Or sorry, it is more likely to be discharged. at the cathode or the anode? Cathode, yeah. So as the E standard, as the reduction potential becomes more positive, it is more likely to be discharged at the cathode. Okay. And so only two, two of these ions are, have the capability of being reduced. Which ones are those? Na plus and H plus, okay? Because these both are positive, we're talking about reduction, which is adding electrons. H plus has no electrons to take, so it, this absolutely cannot be oxidized. And sodium does, but, I mean, we know that the second ionization energy for sodium is so high that it's probably not gonna happen, okay? So these are the only two ions right here that could ever be reduced at the cathode. And so let's compare the E standard values for both of these ions. H plus, plus an electron, is goes to one half H2. What is the E standard for this? Yeah. Zero. Very good. 0, 0.00 volts. Now we have sodium plus, plus an electron, goes to sodium solid. The E standard for this is negative 2.71 volts. Okay, and this makes sense, right? 
we know that sodium ions rarely steal electrons from other things to become sodium solid. The opposite reaction is what happens the most. And so a, net, a really negative uh, E value here is expected. Okay. So which one is going to be produced at the cathode? Hydrogen gas. Okay, so sodium ions are going to stay in solution and hydrogen gas produced or discharged at the cathode. Okay, so cool, we're halfway done. We have to do the same thing for the anode, okay, but at the anode, it's a little bit different, um, like comparing E standard. Like here, we're just comparing which one's more positive. For the anode, um, ACE just kind of gave you a list that you kind of need to memorize. And it's not a long list. And it actually is really helpful. I wish I knew this list when I was in college and doing electrochemistry elsewhere. Because the way they explain it in college, in my opinion, was garbage. So <laughs> um, I guess. I'll do this right here. I think I have enough space. So this is going to be part B to our second section here. The anode, what's discharged at the anode is, is de derived from this list, okay? The likelihood of discharge at the anode is this list. So the least likely thing to be oxidized at the anode is going to be the sulfate ion. Next is nitrate. Next is chloride. Next is hydroxide. Next is bromide. And finally, the most likely ion to be oxidized at the uh, anode is iodine. Okay. So this means iodine is the most likely to be produced or discharged at the anode, while whatever happens when you oxidize sulfate is the least likely to be discharged at the anode. And so if we're looking at chloride and hydroxide here, which one's going to be oxidized at the anode? Hydroxide. Okay, so when we do this, Hydroxide is going to be, not discharged, we're not discharging hydroxide, but hydroxide is going to be oxidized at the anode. Who knows what that reaction will produce? What, what will be discharged at the anode? Oxygen gas, okay? This is a half reaction. I want you to know, I wrote this in the homework, but it is four OH minus plus, oh, shoot, I don't even know it. <laughs> um, this goes to O2 gas plus um, water plus four electrons. Is that balanced? Four H2, this should be two. There we go. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so four hydroxide goes to oxygen gas plus two waters plus four electrons. Okay, that is a, an, an equation that I think they, ACE wants you to know. Okay, uh, because when you electrolyze weak acid, or not weak acids, but when you electrolyze unconcentrated strong acids like sulfuric acid and nitric acid, that's produced at the anode. Okay. So there you go. Uh, we know, oh lol, the, the equation is right there. <laughs> so O2 is discharged at the anode. I got it right, by the way. Um, plus one for Cal, zero for, or Mr. Dilworth, sorry. Um, oof. Zero for my notes. Good job, Cal. <laughs> um, so O2 gas discharged at anode. Okay. Now, this right here is just considering the like the E standard for each ion. So the very last thing that we're going to do is talk about what if the concentration of the ions is changed. Okay. So I'm just going to do this over here. It's super super short. If the relative concentration of the ions gets too high, something else might discharge at the anode or cathode. Cathode. 
cathode or anode. Okay. So I don't really know what the concentration of the sodium chloride here is, but we're assuming it's a, just a normal concentration, maybe one, I don't know. I mean, I guess if we're using E standard values, we're assuming that these are at one mole per decimeter cubed, and so there's that. Uh, but what if we increase the concentration of sodium chloride? Then we have more chloride ions around and more sodium ions around. And so there might be a point or a concentration that if we reach that concentration, there's just way too much sodium or way too much chlorine that instead of hydrogen being discharged at the cathode, maybe sodium's discharged at the cathode. And then instead of uh, uh, oxygen gas being discharged at the anode, maybe chlorine gas is discharged at the anode. Okay. So here, um, this is all they had in the book. They didn't have any numbers here, but they're just saying that a high concentration of sodium chloride will still have hydrogen being discharged at the cathode. This is a really big difference right here. Okay, like negative 2.71 compared to zero, you would have to have a lot of sodium ions in order for sodium to be discharged at the cathode in an aqueous sodium chloride solution. Okay. But uh, here we have hydroxide being right above chloride uh, for being discharged at the anode. And so if we have a really high sodium chloride concentration, we'll actually see chlorine gas discharged at the anode. Okay, so be careful if you ever want to electrolyze sodium chloride solution. Make sure it's not super concentrated, otherwise you'll inhale chlorine gas if you're not in a well ventilated area and get hurt. Because why would you? Uh, low concentration of NACL is, uh, is what we observe there, right? Uh, it's just if it's a low concentration, there's not enough chlorine to override this hierarchy right here, and so we would see oxygen at the end of it. Okay. So I'm just going to say C example. Also, something interesting, uh, and a result of this is as the concentration becomes more dilute, or as the solution becomes more dilute, the amount of oxygen gas discharged at the anode also increases. Okay, so uh, as the solution becomes more dilute, so, uh, amount of O2 gas discharge increases. Okay. And that's it. Bless you. And I'm just going to real quick talk about batteries. I know I said I would do it real quick. Um, I'm going to try to finish before the second period starts. I'm not even going to write notes on the board. If you want to look at my notes, online, you're more than welcome to. I don't think this is interesting. There might be questions asked on ACE that talk about batteries, but it really, I don't think it's going to be that much. And also, it's more of just applications of this. Okay? So batteries are basically just ap applied electrolytic cells. Okay? If you have uh, redox reactions set up in an electrochemical process, it'll produce a voltage, right? And so that's how batteries work. You have electrochemical things interacting with each other. And when you complete a circuit with those electrochemical cells, that's a battery. You're providing voltage to something to run electricity. Okay? And so um, they tell you about cells and batteries. Cells are like those really tiny circle things that like you put in watches, um, like the cell batteries, I guess. Um, they're like really compact really small, and they actually provide a relatively high voltage for their size. So they're really cool um, in that regard. Um, batteries are, of course, like AA, AAA, maybe, um, what are those ones that have both of the little metal things on the end that if you stick your tongue out, and you're like, oh, wow, it's working still. Nine volt batteries, awesome, there you go. Um, those are just normal batteries, right, but there's also rechargeable ones. 
And so when the, basically when the electrochemical cell runs out, it's no longer a good battery. And so usually you just throw this away. But there's also different types of batteries that if you apply that a voltage, you are making that electrochemical cell a electro, sorry, you're making the electrochemical cell now a electrolytic cell. And so you basically restore the products of that redox reaction so that when you're done applying that voltage to the battery, it now can provide voltage back. Okay, so you're basically recharging the battery by reversing the reaction. Okay, so that's kind of neat. Um, so, yeah, um, and then there's the fuel cell, which ACE really um, blew out of proportion, I think. They're like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing in the world. It's the future of energy, which, like, okay, maybe. <laughs> but the, uh, the fuel cell, specifically the one that they wanted to focus on, was the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, which uses hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and produces energy um, to a very high extent compared to like the mass of the stuff being used. Um, and so yeah, it produces lots of energy. Cars can be driven with these fuel cells and it produces no greenhouse gas emissions, which is a very high plus. Um, and it's very, like the, the transition of like reactants into energy doesn't have, like there's no gears. And so there's no energy lost due to friction or heat. And so the, there's a lot of transition from reactants into energy to push a car forward. Um, and so that's awesome. But usually in chemistry, when you have something that's really, really good, there's a really big drawback, okay? At least one. And this is something that I learned, hey. Yeah, okay, uh, what's this? I don't know, Paxton just told me to bring it to you. You can just sit out on the floor right there, thanks. Um, Joanna, yes. and the best thing. Thank you. All the yeah. Um. So the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, super, super awesome, super cool. Except it is super expensive to make. For one, okay, you have to have really high pressurized hydrogen gas. And so, if, like, if we did at this point in time make all gasoline cars go away and use just hydrogen fuel cells, like the expenses of making it aside, um, you would have to, instead of going to a gas station, go to a hydrogen pressurization station and pressurize your hydrogen tank to a really high pressure before you could go. And so there's that. Um, manufacturing the fuel cell is actually super bad for the environment. And so even though the hydrogen fuel cell in general is really good for the environment, actually making it is horrible. And um, they don't well work with temperatures below zero. <laughs> so we're fine. <laughs> we're fine, but nobody north of us is. So that's awkward. So like they, they really hyped it up. They're like, oh, this is awesome. And then they're like, but and these drawbacks, which I'm like, that's kind of a big deal. So um, yeah, anyways, that's what they wanted you to know. That's basically it. Um, if you want to read more up on their batteries thing, it's literally like four paragraphs in the book. Um, so you can, you can do that on your own time. Any questions on this or batteries or anything else? Unit four related? All right. Well, great work. We just finished unit four. Let's do a lab. And then um, if you want to come after school, we'll do a review session. Yeah.